We see issue, issues such as how a government should be ran. People have that different thoughts of how it should be ran. They think maybe it's communism, capitalism, or socialism. And we see that that conflict has actually led to wars. We even see different issues as such as culture clashes. In the area we live in, people feel like they live in a Western culture. So when people from other cultures come here, they feel like these two can't mix or can't get along with each other. We even see other things as simple as sports. Sports have led, many, uh, led to dividing of many different communities, even cities. We see rivalries between cities like Boston and New York. And even in sports, people have fought over these things. It's led them to violence. But perhaps one of the most polarizing issues that can divide somebody is the difference between science and the Bible. As we see in many different cases, such as uh, the question of where did life start, how did life start, or even what's morally accepted, or even see uh, abortion, that's been a huge topic that can easily divide people. This is one of the most polarizing issues that can divide people because it's often on many different topics, causes debates and different things as such. So today, if you think about the title of the talk, is does your hope rest on science or the Bible? So we're gonna be talking about where we should put our hope into, either science or the Bible. As you see that many people, most of the people living in today's time actually put their hope into science. They look at scientific achievement and feel that eventually human beings can make it to some type of utopia. As some people may see the things such as, uh, you know, different diseases, there's been different plagues that have killed millions of people worldwide. But the medical field has caught up to such diseases and uh, gotten rid of them. They're obsolete now. So many people may look at that and say, hey, we're moving towards a better way of life. Or even just the understanding of, of hygiene, that's protected so many people from diseases and things, just the understanding of washing your hands. Or maybe it's the food pro, um, process. There's been so many ways that science has actually helped different vegetation and fruit trees grow more fruit so that they could combat world hunger. So a lot of people feel like Science is the only way we have to changing the human situation that we face today. But what about those who believe in the Bible? Turn with me to Psalms chapter 118 and verse 8. As we see that those who believe in the Bible are given a completely different direction to go. Psalm 118 verse 8 reads, It is better to take refuge in Jehovah than to trust in humans. To the Jew, the Bible is directing us to put our faith in Jehovah God to answer the problems that we face today or to solve our problems. But there's been a lot of opponents of the Bible who don't believe in the Bible. They don't even believe if there's a God. They say God doesn't exist. So why should you put your faith in the Bible if God doesn't exist? Well, let's let, let's let the Bible show us why we can put faith that God even exists. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1, verse 20. This is going to direct us to where we ourselves can look out and find evidence of a God. Here we read in Romans 1, verse 20. For his invisible qualities are clearly seen from the world's creation onward. Because they are perceived by the things made, even his eternal power and Godship, so that they are inexcusable. So we see the Bible is pointing to us. If you want evidence that there is a God, simply look around you. When you look at the evidence, you look at the orderliness of the solar system. Maybe when you look at the planet, even when you look at ecosystems, or maybe maybe it's the anatomy of the human body. All of it shows a clear, uh, a clear, it shows clearly that there is intelligent design in it at all times. When we look at all these things, 
just to illustrate that a little, I heard this illustration. It'd be as though you're walking on the beach, right? Feet in the sand, you're walking along, and you see a glass bottle in the sand. And you may wonder to yourself, how did that bottle get there? Now, would you assume that a portion of the sand applied heat to itself, which made it a glob, and then when the wind blew, it gave it a shape as the bottle, and then at nighttime, it cooled the bottle, creating a bottle to be left in the sand? Is that feasible? Nobody will ever believe something like that. No one would think that. Most likely when you're walking in the sand and you see a glass bottle, you're going to think to yourself, someone littered. Someone put that bottle there. It, it makes the most sense. So when you look at creation, when you look at the design of it, there's no way that this just came about by chance. Somebody must have placed it here. But also looking at creation, it can also show us what type of God, what type of creator we have. It shows his immense love for all human beings. How is that? When you think about the capabilities of human beings, we don't need a lot of things to have us continue living on. You don't have to see in color to avoid walking to a wall. You don't have to taste food to get the minerals from the food that you eat. You don't have to be able to enjoy music and dance and laughter with other human beings just to live on. But we see that we have these capabilities. What does that show about our creator? That means he created us with love so we can enjoy his creation. That's what he wanted us to do. He wanted us to enjoy ourselves. So all this, when you take a look at creation, it points to a creator. But if you just look back at the scripture, in verse 20, and the last scripture it says, so that they or say the last sentence, even his internal power and Godship, so that they are inexcusable. There's so much evidence around us that there is a God who loves us, that it is inexcusable. You know, I even heard another illustration of why it can be seen as inexcusable to try to deny a God. It can be seen as a man who is driving to work he takes the same route for years. <laughs> to this day, he drives out, he goes to work, and everything's the same. But on his way back, he sees this huge sign that says detour, turn right. There's cones, and even other cars turn right. So when he hits this intersection, he just says, man, it'd be shorter if I go straight right to home my usual way. So he blows right through the intersection. A cop sees him. A cop pulls him over. He instantly tries to make a case of why he shouldn't get a ticket. He says, you know, it'd be easy, it makes more sense that I go home right here and I didn't see the sign officer. All the officer has to say is that sign was put in a position where it can easily be seen. You, as a driver, have the responsibility to heed all the traffic signs and you have the capability and eyesight to see the signs, so here's your ticket, get on your way. <laughs> it's inexcusable, and the same way goes for the creation that we see today. We cannot deny that God has immense love for us because clearly creation points to that, and it's really inexcusable. But even though there's ample reason to believe in a creator, oftentimes people, they still don't believe in a creator, or they may just seem as though following after what science has to say is the best way to go. They feel like that is the only hope, the only logical hope that we should go, go by. But is that the case? Is science the most logical way to go, to look forward to, to put our hope into? Well, let's think about it. Undoubtedly, we all benefit from science and modern technology, right? All of us got telephones and smartphones, things like that. Uh, we all use the internet. The internet is a powerful tool you can use if you use it in the right way. It gives you all types of information on, you know, a history project, all the way to patching a hole in the wall. 
We all have cars for easy transportation. And even as Jehovah's Witnesses, all of us undoubtedly uh, benefit from the advancement, med the medical advancement of bloodless tr uh, surgeries, right? We all appreciate that type of medical advancement. However, even though science does a lot of good, they also create a lot of bad, don't, do they not? Thinking about yeah. science, right? Uh, a long time ago, human beings wanted to make life easier for all, for everyone, right? So they said, we want to give electricity to everybody. So they came up with these power plants, these electrical power plants to generate electricity for entire communities. Now that's a good thing. We all benefit from electricity. We benefit from it right now. Lights on. When we go home, we get lights on. And we also get hospitals to have them running 24-7. So power plants are a benefit. But also, power plants are known to be the most, the biggest cause for air pollution in the entire <coughs> planet. It is said that 386,000 tons of air pollutants comes from power plants. 13,000 people die annually from complications from these pollutions. So in an effort to try to do good for mankind, they created a huge problem. But they then tried to solve the problem. They say, let's get clean energy instead of this dirty fossil fuel energy, right? So instead of fossil fuel power plants, they wanted to go with nuclear power plants. Now, nuclear power plants are actually known to be clean energy. It saves thousands of tons of air pollutants from entering the atmosphere. However, nuclear power plants also causes nuclear waste. Nuclear waste is harmful to every organism on this planet. It remains radioactive for perhaps thousands of years. So this, of course, makes another problem of how to handle nuclear waste and how to dispose of nuclear waste. Some people think, oh, you know, we just put it in these metal barrels and we just bury, bury it underneath the earth. A simple earthquake could just happen and burst those barrels wide open and now you got a radioactive leak in, right into the environment or they tried to bury it in the sea. Undoubtedly, that salt water would eat right through those, bur those metal barrels and release that nuclear waste in the sea, poisoning all the fish and the, uh, the, the animal life that's under the sea. So clearly then, in scientific efforts to try to make good for humankind, they created a bad situation. To fix that bad situation, they created it an even worse situation. And this is it's been constantly the the theme of scientific exploration and scientific progress. We have other terms such as acid rain. Now acid rain is when those same pollutants go into the air and it rains down, but it traps the pollutants and it drops it to the soil. That way, those pollutants go into the soil and take up all the minerals so that grass and trees can't grow. You also heard of terms such as greenhouse gases and even deforestation. So in their effort, their noble effort to try to make life better for human beings, they have oftentimes created a, bad, a worse situation for all of us. So really then, can you really put your hope into science to bring about necessary changes for humankind? Can they really usher in a utopia? The answer is clearly no. But just to take it another step further, can you really put your trust into scientists and the things they say? You have to think about the scientific field. What do you think about when you think of a scientist? Oftentimes, you think of a kind-hearted person, someone who wants good, right, in, the, in this world. He wants good for everybody. I mean, they have the intellect to go and be a Fortune 500 CEO or something like that, or maybe go play in the stock market. They have the intellect to go for more lucrative careers, but instead, 
They focus on science and trying to help the lives of so many human beings, which is a noble cause. However, the scientific field, the com competition in the scientific field is savage. The successes a scientist is going to have in his field is totally dependent on how much his research gets publicated in different publications. So what they want to do is try to publish as much research as they possibly can because their promotion depends on it, their chances for employment depends on it, their tenure at a college depends on it, and even if they get government aid, all depends on how much research they can get published. Well, do you know what that has led to? Whoops. <laughs> do you know what that has led to? Well, that has led to many different scientists cutting corners and trying to get their publication published. That's led many of them to take research and data from other scientists that's made them to just straight make up stuff. Make up that, oh, I ran all these tests and trials, even though they haven't done so. It really makes them cut corners and find a way to get ahead in life. So they can't beat this rat race in the system that we see today. So can you really put your hope and trust in scientists? You can't. They, their reputation has been shot because of all of these bad things that they have done. However, can you put your faith in the Bible? Why is that? <coughs> what makes it possible for you to put your faith and trust in the Bible? What makes the Bible so reliable, a reliable source for all of us in today's time? Well, let's let the Bible answer that. Turn me to Job chapter 26. In this scripture, it is uh, an amazing scripture when you think about it. Because you see the accuracy of the Bible. And you got to keep in mind that this book was published to, or written, this was written 2,000 years ago, thousands of years ago. Here we read, this is Job 26, 7. It says, he stretches out the northern sky over empty space, suspending the earth upon nothing. Now, why is that amazing? Well, you know, at the time, what, was, what did most people believe was holding up the earth? Most believed that there were some type of creatures under there that held up the earth, right? We would see Aristotle, who's a respected scientist of mind, even in today's time. You know what he thought? He thought there was something out there that held all these planets together because it just didn't make sense that nothing would just hang in there. Thousand years forward to Sir Isaac Newton. He came close. He had an idea that it was gravity holding planets together, <coughs> right? Even at that time, he was ridiculed for that position he took. Many people thought, thought that was supernatural. They just couldn't get over the fact that if nothing is held up by something, it will fall. So in their head, there's no way that a planet was hanging upon nothing. However, a couple years, some years after Sir Isaac Newton, that's when they began to realize that the earth really did hang upon nothing. So if you were rewind back 2,000 years ago, with no telescope, no satellite images, Job knew that the earth hung upon nothing. How? He didn't have the resources to even make a guess like that. There was no way that he knew that. What does that point to? It points to that the word that Job written was inspired of God, a higher being, must inspire him to write that down. Let's go to another scripture. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30. You know, oftentimes in the world that we live in, many people feel like the Bible is out of date. That human beings living in modern times can't learn anything from the Bible anymore. 
But in this scripture that was, again, written thousands of years ago, we see some good information. This is the first half of it reads, A calm heart gives life to the body. Now, it was just in recent times that medical and medical doctors and physicians have learned that the emotions of a human being will have an effect on your physical body. They just learned that not too long ago. They learned that if someone is angry, it's usually linked to a high blood pressure, liver problems, and a list of other problems, usually. And even if someone flies off the handle, going this fit of anger, usually that person afterwards will have an extreme case of depression. These are things that medical researchers have just found out not too long ago, but yet we see that in the Bible. That type of practicality, how did this Bible writer know that? How would he have put it together? He didn't have the research of what doctors have today. Undoubtedly, the only way he was able to know that is because he was inspired by God, a higher being. And that's the only reason why he was able to learn that. So there's many different uh, ways to see, ways that we can see reasons that we have to put our faith in the Bible. Many different reasons. The earth hanging upon nothing is only one the scientific, accurately scriptures in the Bible. You have other things like the water cycle and even many more. The practicality of the Bible actually shows that it is influenced by someone else as well other than human beings. So we can believe in the Bible. We can believe in its promises and we can put our trace, trust that the things it says are true. And we definitely, definitely want to do that. So if you will, turn with me to another scripture, Psalms 146. And we're going to read verses 3 and 4. And we get some more direction from the Bible. Here it reads, Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man, who cannot bring salvation. His spirit goes out, he returns to the ground, on that very day, his thoughts perish. So even though we see science have made many different progresses or successes in their mind, we still don't want to put our faith as to it being the sole way we find answers to the human problems on earth. But instead, we want to look forward to Jehovah God, a God who has the power and the want to solve all of our problems. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Williams, for helping us to appreciate how the Bible is the true hope for all mankind. Now we're going to continue our, our meeting. This time we have a Bible study by means of the Watchtower magazine, and Brother uh, Dory is going to help conduct that meeting. Brother Dory. We're glad to see all of you here with us uh, this beautiful afternoon. We'd like to invite you to stand if you are able to do so. We're going to sing one of our uh, beautiful songs. Song number 124, Ever Loyal. So let's sing with Peter. Ever Loyal. It's okay if you shake that.
singing. Appreciate that very much. Our theme, uh, our lesson for today is entitled, Overturn Every Reasoning That Is Against the Knowledge of God. Now, the theme scripture is 2 Corinthians 10, 5, which reads, We are overturning reasonings and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. But you notice the title for the watchtower is, Overturn Every Reasoning That Is Against the Knowledge of God. So that has to do with us personally, what each one of us needs to do. Now, why, why is this watchtower lesson so very important? Because today, for you and I, our thinking is influenced by our background, our culture, and our education. We may find that certain wrong attitudes have become firmly entrenched in our personality. Uh, and so this article will help to show you and I how we can gain control over any wrong tendencies that we may have developed. So we're going to have a wonderful discussion. We have uh, uh, a number of uh, cited scriptures and so forth that we want you to comment on, and uh, also illustrations that we're going to be commenting on as well. We've asked Brother Alton to do the reading for us today, and we'd like to get started with paragraph one. Let's notice the warning that the Apostle Paul wrote to anointed Christians. <coughs> Stop, warned the Apostle Paul. Stop what? Stop being molded by the system of things. Paul addressed those words to the first century Christians. Why did he give such strong admonition to men and women who were dedicated to God and anointed with Holy Spirit? So question one says, what warning did the Apostle Paul write to anointed Christians? Uh, let Trifinia, please. Stop being molded by the system of things. Okay, very good. And so, um, when we get to an intersection, what do the authorities tell us to do sometimes? We see a sign there, red, <coughs> white. Uh, Sister Newman, please. Stop. Stop, which means, Sister Newman? Stop. Okay. <laughs> Because in, in California, what, what do people do sometimes? Ah, Brother Marin, Andrew. Don't accuse me of this. <laughs> it's called the California stop. You sort of make an attempt, but you don't, all four wheels don't come to a stop. Oh. <laughs> Wait, Brother Ross and I will talk to you after the media. <laughs> but that's what it is, right? It says stop, S-T-O-P. That's what he's telling it. Stop. Okay. So. How does Satan, how does Satan try to turn us, persuade us to turn us against Jehovah? Let's see how we can root some of this stuff out. Paragraph two through three, please. Paul was concerned because some Christians were apparently being influenced by the unwholesome reasonings and philosophies promoted by Satan's world. That can happen to any one of us. In a desperate attempt to turn us away from Jehovah, Satan, the God of this system of things, uses various tactics. One of them is that of exploiting any tendency we may have towards selfish ambition or self-promotion. He may even use certain aspects of our background, our culture, or our education to bring us over to his way of thinking. Is it possible for us to root out things that are strongly entrenched in our minds? Notice how Paul answers. We are overturning reasonings and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are bringing every thought into captivity to make it obedient to the Christ. Yes, with Jehovah's help, we can actually gain control over wrong reasonings. Just as medicine can counteract, counteract the effects of poison, God's word can help us to counteract the poisonous effects of Satan's world. Very good. Thank you very much, Brother Alvin. And... Uh, we would like to have a volunteer read for us, Ephesians 4, 17 to 19, after we look at the question. Uh, Sister Becca, please, you can read that for us. So our question is, how does Satan try to turn us against Jehovah? Let's get that portion first of all. Ajayda, come here, please.
He tries to, by the unwholesome reasoning and philosophies promoted by his world. Yes, thank you very much. And let's have my sister Becca read for us Ephesians 4, 17 through 19 to see exactly the, 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 the swamp that you and I live in. People. We see issue, issues such as how a government should be ran. People have their different thoughts of how it should be ran. They think maybe it's communism, capitalism, or socialism. And we see that that conflict has actually led to wars. We even see different issues as such as culture clashes. In the area we live in, people feel like they live in a Western culture. So when people from other cultures come here, they feel like these two can't mix or can't get along with each other. We even see other things as simple as sports. Sports have led, many, uh, led to dividing of many different communities in the cities. We see rivalries between cities like Boston and New York. And even in sports, people have fought over these things. It's led them to violence. But perhaps one of the most polarizing issues that can divide somebody is the difference between science and the Bible. As we see in many different cases, such as uh, the question of where did life start, how did life start, or even what's morally accepted, or even see uh, abortion, that's been a huge topic that can easily divide people. This is one of the most polarizing issues that can divide.